Honourable Member. Make Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, I stand like my other colleagues to oppose the extension of the state of emergency. Mr. Speaker, I also want to join my colleagues in extending solidarity to the firefighters on the international recognition of their profession. And Mr. Speaker, to also extend our support and solidarity and sympathies with our colleague who buried his son yesterday. Mr. Speaker, the member from Castro is East and the leader of opposition called on St. Lucians to be patient, to be peaceful, and do not give in to any attempts to create in this country that there is a sense of unrest and instability. When I drove to Parliament this morning, I was absolutely shocked to see the security setup that was in effect for the, guard, for the meeting of Parliament today. I had seen a notice put out by the police yesterday speaking of intelligence that they had gotten, that there was going to be unrest in the country and words to that effect. And I wondered how irresponsible it was of the hierarchy of the police force to issue such a statement. It is almost as if they were saying and themselves seeking to incite unrest in this country. And you came to Parliament this morning and you did not see any crowds involved in any unrest. And we want to say to the people of St. Lucia, you will make your statement in the ballot box. There is no need, there is no need for confrontation or any unrest or any instability. We have suffered for five years and we will suffer a little longer if necessary. Our forefathers suffered for hundreds of years under slavery, and slavery ended one day, Mr. Speaker. We are descendants of a people who know what suffering is. We know what it is to struggle to survive. And if we have to wait a few more weeks for us to make a statement in the ballot box, we will make it. We don't need to engage in any instability. And like a former Member of the Labour Party once said, you know that workers' party is like a phlegm on our chest. We're just waiting to exhale, Mr. Speaker. Right, Mr. Speaker, if we are asked to consider the extension of the state of emergency, you will have to do so against a background of what was the consequences of the previous state of emergency that was in effect, what had been the experiences of previous states of emergency, and therefore, whether by its nature it is required to be extended for five months. And we know we first had a state of emergency from March last year. So if you're asking for us to approve an extension, let us analyze what has happened when we had a state of emergency? And then for us to decide whether or not it is necessary to have an extension. But I am minded to note that the member from Miku South stated that the only reason why we need to have a state of emergency is because we need to have a curfew in place. We need to have a curfew in place. So in many ways, we need to analyze the criticality of having a curfew in place. And we need to examine whether or not that this is a real argument, or is it a constructed argument for purposes of political control. But I think every member in here will agree that COVID-19 has tested our resolve as a nation. But it has demanded a quality of leadership that recognizes that first and foremost, 
that the people of St. Lucia matter most. At no other point in time in the history of this country, certainly from my knowledge, my reading, my recollection, has a situation demanded quality leadership like what we face with COVID-19. And I'm sure the majority of St. Lucians will see that this government has failed them. And you will note in my presentation two very clear themes will emerge. One, that this government has not shown the kind of caring that the people of St. Lucia wanted to experience during this COVID pandemic. And secondly, that there are two St. Lucias. And Mr. Speaker, if you believe I am stepping out of line over the next few minutes, please point it out to me. Let us start, Mr. Speaker, with the medical issues that we've had to confront with, even whilst having a curfew. If you ask St. Lucians, and I'm sure, Mr. Speaker, even you, when you saw this document extending a state of emergency for five months, you wondered what the hell is going on. I'm sure you wondered, and I'm sure you attempted to pick up your phone and say to the Prime Minister, you cannot do this. I'm sure members opposite, they cannot convince me that they agree with this because they are on the ground campaigning and they're hearing what St. Lucians are saying. And if you ask them in an honest moment, <laughs> in an honest moment, whether St. Lucians have been satisfied with the medical management of COVID, they will tell you no. Have we done enough testing in St. Lucia? Have we done enough, Mr. Speaker, education, especially in regards to vaccination? We've had exchanges in this house about the respiratory hospital. And I heard a member from Cassie South speak about how the World Bank praised them about the respiratory hospital. But yet when the member from Cassie East stood up and spoke about the lack of proper oxygen for supplies at the hospital, members opposite got very nervous and reacted. But it was true. It was true. There are solutions that have died because we have not put in place the proper facilities required for COVID management. And as a result, we've had deaths more than all the OCS countries added together with Barbados. That is reality. That is reality. This is how they have managed COVID. Does the state of emergency make a difference to, in, to the incompetence of this government? You see, because they did not put the people first and foremost. When we spoke about it, they said we were being mischievous. And they insulted the people of St. Lucia by saying that it was the Labour Party that caused the spike in COVID. Traumatizing people who are already traumatized by the COVID pandemic. There are people who died who did not get the care and attention. Does the SOS solve that problem? That's incompetence. And you know what they said to the people of St. Lucia? And they keep doing it. Almost everyone who died had underlying conditions. And I've said to them, they keep reminding me of the trial in the US of Floyd. He would not have died if the white officer had not put, put his knees on his neck. He had underlying conditions. And this government, in a very uncaring way, Speaker, on a point of order, there comes a point, Mr. Speaker, where we have to take the business of government and this country far much more seriously than the member from Cass Street South has taken it. To suggest that anybody in St. Lucia has died of COVID because of lack of facilities or the lack of oxygen is egregious, it is false, and I'm asking him to withdraw that. The people who are the medical workers of this country deserve much better. And at no point 
has any report come to my office to suggest that anyone has died because of lack of facilities in this country. And despite the fact that we have provided evidence, at no time was there a shortage of oxygen at any one of our facilities. Yet, the member continues to say there has been a lack of oxygen and that it's true. I appeal to you, Mr. Speaker, to ask the member to withdraw that statement because it's an embarrassment, not dissimilar from the statements he made in Dominica. Just that. Just that. Can I continue, Mr. Speaker? Yeah. You can ask for what you want from now till end of eternity. Yeah. You're not the one deciding that. You're not the one deciding that. Honorable member. And you can cry too. Honorable member. Yeah, I'm with you, Mr. Speaker. Honorable member. Whether, whether or not, whether or not, so that um, that person died here is difficult. I'll put it this way. We are all representative of the people, and we in this chamber supposed to always give the best of ourselves and always, I believe, create an impression of St. Lucia that, is, that upholds its reputation as a place for persons to live and enjoy. Your opinion as to the state of affairs is always your opinion, but it should never in any way infringe on that national pride, I believe, that we should all have. In order, in other situations where members have, been, have made statements, we must always be careful what we say, because we should never, ever give the impression that things are such and that we, as honorable members, condoning things that will bring St. Lucia, our system, our health care, our policing into disrepute. I will ask you that you need to be so careful that, that um, we do not, and you should not, indicate that our healthcare workers did not do the very best for persons who, unfortunately, contracted COVID and passed away. And we must always be sensitive to the need, to the, the feelings of our people. And I remember, I would ask you from the, to desist from from making any more statements to that inf to that effect. And on. on on, honorable, honorable, honorable members. No. Um, This is, this is, your opinion is your opinion, but then it, I do not want any impression of the parliament to be in any way. Honorable member, I'll ask that you, we 
I will I will take it on my own if you so if you wish not to, but I will strike out that part of your. I do not want anyone to believe that any member in this house, regardless of our opinion, is given the impression that as a unit, as a parliament, that um, we are not sensitive to persons. Uh, you may proceed, honorable member. You need to turn on your mic. So, I think it is also a fact that somebody committed suicide at the hospital. It is a fact. It is a fact. And Mr. Speaker, I need to proceed because I would have given names. Because St. Richard is a small place. You don't know who is sister, brother, girlfriend, jabal, husband, wife of people. So it is very easy for me to give names and to explain and provide details but today is not the day for that. People have had their sorrow, and we are moving on. But I can also say, Mr. Speaker, that we failed to make adequate preparations for vaccines. And we were humbled to have to accept vaccines from Dominica and Barbados, I think, Mr. Speaker, because we did not make arrangements. This country did not make arrangements. And when other countries we're getting a lot more than us. We had to accept point, a donation. On a, on a point of order, the entire Caribbean received donations in different batches. Barbados and Dominica, knowing that our batches were going to come, advanced them us for our frontline workers, of which we're deeply appreciative. But for the member to suggest that the Caribbean did not work in unison, again, is his misunderstanding and probably hopeful wishes. But again, Mr. Speaker, it is erroneous and it's not true. <laughs> Honorable member, the issue of vaccine have been no, I, I'm making a point, spoken and debated. I'm making a point Continuum. about the medical management because I can give the name of the person in Mr. Modi's office that was responsible for the vaccine, you know, donations. But let's put that aside. Because their days have been counted down for them, Mr. Speaker. Let me tell you, you, you behave, members opposite are behaving like they are cornered, Mr. Speaker. But let's move on, Mr. Speaker. I heard a member from Miku South. I heard a member from Miku South speak, Mr. Speaker, about herd immunity. Herd immunity being achieved in St. Lucia. Now, Mr. Speaker, the people of St. Lucia must sit and analyze it. So far, Mr. Speaker, so far, we have about 25,000 people that have received a single dose, and a few hundred may have received both doses. To reach the level of herd immunity, we need to have about 120,000 people receiving both doses. About 70% of our population. I heard this morning on CNN that the U.S. is even starting to discuss what happens if the U.S. does not achieve herd immunity. Because a survey show that at least 25% of Americans will not take the vaccine. That takes it down to 75%. But the Prime Minister is in the House this morning in a debate on the extension of state of emergency and he's talking about achieving herd immunity. 120,000 St. Lucians receiving both doses. How is that going to be done? Where are the vaccines going to be coming from? Under the state of emergency, Mr. Speaker, that we are extending to October 16th, Mr. Speaker? Tell me, unless in that meeting in Barbados, he was making a special request from the U.S. to send down vaccines to us. Because maybe, or maybe you should tell St. Lucians what was discussed at the meeting. Uh, honorable Mr. Member, Speaker, honor so... Honorable Member, we don't speak to other members directly. My apologies, Mr. Speaker. Always through you. So, Mr. Speaker, tell us about this herd immunity that you are now putting on the table as the next big achievement for this government, Mr. Speaker, under a state of emergency that will exist until October 16th, Mr. Speaker. And I noted this morning... 
an announcement is made that there is a, Cari a Caribbean bubble. So you can now go to Barbados and you won't have to quarantine for 14 days, Mr. Speaker. You won't have to. But the point is, is there a Caribbean bubble? Or is it a St. Lucian bubble with other Caribbean countries? Because just like the member from Miku South and the leader of opposition says he wants to go to Barbados, I have to go to Barbados too. And I know up to this morning what the requirements were if you went to Barbados. There is no bubble. If you land in Barbados, you won't have to do quarantine. There is no such bubble. If you go to Barbados now and you have received both doses, you, you do a test, you wait 24 hours for the results. If it is negative, you then can go out. You still have to do a test and you still have to spend at least a day in quarantine in Barbados right now. But we are not in St. Lucia on May 3rd, effective May 3rd, we have a Caribbean bubble. And make St. Lucians believe that it is okay to go to Barbados and come back without quarantine. But I'll come back to that later on, Mr. Speaker. So, my time has run out for the medical management. Let's look at social, Mr. Speaker. And this is where this becomes even critical. Who will deny in St. Lucia that social tensions are at an all-time high? This is the highest incidence of crime that we've ever had in St. Lucia, even if a state of emergency. We were told that Kenny cannot stop crime, but I will. And we've had the most homicides in the history of St. Lucia. We've had high numbers of homicides, even when we had a state of emergency. So why are we having, Mr. Speaker? Mr. Speaker, so the social tensions caused, Mr. Speaker, by those arrangements and by an uncaring government has raised the level of social conflict in this country, Mr. Speaker. This is the state of our country. This is what the COVID pandemic has caused. This government did not cause the pandemic, but they've not managed it in a way where they've said to St. Lucians, let us bring out the best in you to come out and support your community and to be part of a national endeavor. They've lost the trust of the people of St. Lucia. And the longer this state of emergency continue, the worse it is. Mr. Speaker, I never appreciated the effect of a curfew on people until I sat with the boys on the block. And he said to me, boss man, when curfew come, where are we going? The number of persons in a little house in some of the communities, some of the guys live and then if their parents home, their mother, in most cases, home. When they have to go in at 7 p.m. until 5 o'clock next morning, what do they do? They don't have television. Some of them don't have Netflix. And they started to explain to me the effect of that day in, day out, out Mr. Speaker. And how it, be, how it builds up that tension and that anger in them. Now for me, my house probably, so I can always move between the kitchen, the living room and the bedroom. I mean, that's the free room. Some of us in here, members opposite, probably have houses that have, you know, six bedrooms, 15 room houses. So they, they have space. They can move about in their homes. They don't understand the social tensions of being indoors every single night from 9 p.m. until 5 next morning. And to do it for five more months. For five more months. And remember, we always said from day one, we were opposed to the state of emergency because we believe the government can have restrictions on the other legislation. But we would have supported the government then because we felt we had to fight the COVID crisis. So, Mr. Speaker, you really need to ask, do we need to have in this country five more months of the state of emergency, given the social tensions that we have in this country? And that, and that leads to the emotional trauma that this pandemic has brought to this country. And we, we're very quick to discount those things. From the professionals, the frontline workers, police officers, nurses, doctors, the, the, the emotional trauma this thing has brought about, Mr. Speaker. People feel trapped. People feel defeated. People feel that they've lost control of their lives and they don't know where the next meal is coming from and how their lives will unfold, Mr. Speaker. And I keep saying that to members opposite. Don't your constituents come to you and speak to you about the COVID pandemic and the effect it is having on them and their family lives? 
And you want five more months of this, Mr. Speaker? Five more months? Just last week, and I can read it for you, the Ministry of Health issued a statement saying how cases were decreasing, saying how we were managing it better in this country. And it makes me ask the question, don't we have triggers or we have indicators that will trigger action? So if we're saying cases are decreasing, it's been managed better, deaths are declining, why are we having the longest extension of the state of emergency? Why? Think about that, Mr. Speaker. You are talking about opening up the country to cruise ships and to more flights from the UK and flights from the US, but you're extending the state of emergency. I, I, I mean, I need somebody to explain the logic of this to me, Mr. Speaker. Our people are traumatized, and the state of emergency is not helping our emotional trauma, Mr. Speaker. Now, Let's look at the economic. And, and I have to speak about the economic, Mr. Speaker. Because, and the member from Viewfort North spoke about it, some of the small businesses, the restaurants, some of the places that need to operate on different hours to what the state of emergency and by extension the curfew imposes on them. Who's really talking about them? Who, Mr. Speaker? But you are still hearing that we are opening up the country. This is the same government, the same member from Miku South, who said, why he saves lives if they don't have livelihoods? And he boasted that, yes, he said it. But who is caring about those people, Mr. Speaker? Who is caring about them? You want five more months of the state of emergency. Are we hearing any special program of assistance for those people? And I can't help but by, by say it, Mr. Speaker, from last year, I came to this house begging, begging for step, for cleanups in the community, to mobilize the communities, give them a little soulagement, give them a little strength. No, we're not making mendicants of the people and beggars of the people. But now, they are all over the constituency giving contracts to clean up $200 a day. $200 a day. I'm afraid of that. I'm making them take the money and we're eating it every night. But Mr. Speaker, Mr. Speaker, these are the same people who refuse to give the guys any cleanup contract all during COVID when people were crying, they would not give it to them. And I kept warning one particular member at the side, this thing about mendicants and beggars of our people. Now, are you all making mendicants and beggars of them when you give them those contracts? But our people are feeling it. We are feeling it. If you say things are better, if the cases are going down, if you say you are opening up to cruise ships, you are opening up to more flights, why can't you open up the local economy more? Why can't you open up the local economy more? Because you're opening up for more hotels to open, more flights, more cruise ships, but you're not opening up the local, you're still suffocating the people by five more months of this? This is sheer wickedness, Mr. Speaker. This is wickedness. There is no rational reason for this. I don't know if there can be any rational reason, but this makes no sense. And the more you think that if you are going to open up, if you are going to allow more activity, if you concede things are getting better, then why this for five more months? There has to be another reason, Mr. Speaker. I cannot support this. Mr. Speaker, let's go on to the political. You know, I am convinced, Mr. Speaker, that the extension of the state of emergency for five more months is all about politics. Nothing to do with COVID. I am convinced in my mind about that, Mr. Speaker. This is the same government that said to us, during the peak of the second wave or whatever, the spike, that we had in place a voluntary curfew. Remember this, Mr. Speaker? A voluntary curfew. And they said it was fine, it was working. And we said we didn't need to have any requirement to have it. St. Lucian's would cooperate. There was a voluntary curfew. 
and that St. Lucians, largely in their view, who are abiding by it. But why can't we go back to the voluntary curfew now? Why? Why can't we? And you, I always remember we were told that the COVID Act would have provided all the requirements to manage COVID. Then all of a sudden, something clicked. And then a state of emergency was introduced. So remember, there were protocols and there was a voluntary curfew. But something happened along the way that made them introduce a state of emergency and now want to extend it for five months. What is that something? Is it results and analysis coming from Barbados? The irony of it is the longer they take, the worse they make it for some of the others, Mr. Speaker. So, you know, anyway, that's the headache. That's not mine, Mr. Speaker. It's, you see this, Mr. Speaker, this extension is all about control. It's all about control. And maybe in many ways, it exposes that colonialism really does not have a conscience. It doesn't have a conscience. We are living that now that colonialism does not have a conscience. In the midst of a COVID pandemic, when people are crying out for some empathy, for some understanding of their situation, they have been squeezed further and further. Mr. Speaker, I was really disturbed by what happened this morning when I drove to Parliament. Because I'm reflecting as I came along the corner, do you know what I saw straight ahead of me? John Compton statute. And I'm thinking of all the civil rights advances we've had in this country. George Charles gave us the right to vote and other freedoms. John Compton himself took us to independence. And I'm driving to Parliament. And they've constructed a reality of unrest and instability. And the Parliament, the expression of the people, has been called off, Mr. Speaker. Is that necessary? And you know, this is the UWP of Alan Chastney and Guy Joseph. I'm convinced of it. It's about control, Mr. Speaker. Control, Mr. Speaker. Oh, I'm sorry, the member of Miku South and the member of Castro South is. That kind of control, that kind of repression, Mr. Speaker. And you see it in the reaction, Mr. Speaker. And I know he will stand on a point of order anytime, Mr. Speaker. So let him do so. You know what they say to the people of St. Michel? Let me tell you how they're thinking. They will come to this house, they will pass laws, so the people of Central have to stay at home. But they can go out anytime they want. They can line, they can dance. I don't know what kind of dance is that. Maybe they should have asked a member from Strozel Saltibus to show some better dance moves, Mr. Speaker. At least he knows how to dance Jerusalem, Mr. Speaker. So, and it was after 9 p.m. on a live show on TV, live show on TV, Mr. Speaker, not a pre-recorded, a live show, Mr. Speaker, no mass. And Mr. Speaker, so if you now as a solution say you're suffering, oh, don't worry, this is SLP propaganda. This is SLP. No, it is serious because the people of St. Lucia are seeing those things that on one hand you are passing laws, COVID wardens are coming after people trying to enforce the law, but they're seeing live on television the breaking of the protocols, Mr. Speaker. They're seeing it, Mr. Speaker. This is not made-up stories, Mr. Speaker. So, there's a protocol that says if you come into the country, you must do 14 days quarantine, Mr. Speaker. 14 days quarantine. Honorable Member, may I ask that, um, are, you, are you going down the same line that I want the member? Are you going down the same line that I want the Honorable Member for Vifort North not to? No, I'm not. I, I didn't say they broke laws. I said they did not follow the protocols. I think there is a kind of slight difference. I, I don't know. You're the magistrate. Uh, you can guide Be careful, me. careful. And remember. if you think I'm... Okay, I, I, I'll, I'll go wrong it differently, Mr. Speaker. So, again, as I drove and I saw the police, and I recall the Prime Minister, the member of Miko South, talking about my police. How it could be your police? How? How could it be your police? And how can the police endorse that kind of, of action against the people of St. Lucia? We imagine, Mr. Speaker, and I need to tell you that one. What was you know, 
imagine the people of St. Lucia cannot meet on Constitution Park. Now, you're a man of history and understanding civilization. Constitution Park is supposed to represent a sacred place. A sacred place that the people, when I was growing up as a young man, there used to be loudspeakers outside this chamber. And especially on budget days, people would sit there and listen to parliamentary debates. It was a way of democratizing our decision making. It was a way of empowering our people where they can sit out there in Constitution Park and listen to their parliamentarians because they wouldn't come in here to sit. When this government came in power in 2016, they stopped it, Mr. Speaker. They stopped it. And today, they want to put police out there. They want to put police out there and stop the people Honourable from assembling. Honorable member, is yeah. it? Is it? No, no, no. no. The is speaker's it, outside. Is it, is it correct that well, um, it was stopped in 2016? Yeah, yeah, yes, yes, Mr. I speaker. I don't know, so I'm just yeah, asking. Yeah. It wasn't your time. You would never do such a thing, Mr. Speaker. You know, but let me tell you, Mr. Speaker, you know an old man said to me, the way he feels is like the, the member from Microsoft has his knees on his neck, preventing him from breathing. And he tells me to say in the house that he wants to breathe. Honorable. Mr. Speaker. That is what, Mr. Mr. Speaker? Honorable. Mr. Speaker, again. Honorable member, I know that um, members out there may ask you to say things in Sorry. here and there because you have privilege in here, but um, it's not everything somebody out there say that you should come inside of here and say. Hey. That one is... You want me to take because we, we know exactly the impression of what it is trying to indicate. Please withdraw this one. So, withdraw that the, what he told me to say or yes, withdraw sir. what he said? <laughs> okay. Honorable you, member. Mr. Mr. Speaker, you've been very, 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 you know, rigid today, uh, yeah. Mr. Speaker. Uh -huh. But uh -huh. if you don't want me to say it, yes, Mr. Speaker... withdraw the... the I'll, I'll move on. You want Thank me to withdraw it? Much. Yes, Honorable I withdraw it, Mr. Speaker. Thank you very much. But the people of St. Lucia are feeling that they have been choked of their democratic expression in this country, Mr. Speaker. And they want relief, Mr. Speaker. They want to be relieved, Mr. Speaker. The people of St. Lucia have gotten disgusted with dancing of Jerusalem. And no matter how much Jerusalem the member from Miku South dances to, Mr. Speaker, he will still have to go when the elections are held, Mr. Speaker. And he will not see the new Jerusalem, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, the member from Jeffrey South raised some constitutional issues and some matters to do with dates. Mr. Speaker, June 6 will be five years since we had elections. Elections are supposed to be held before June 6, Mr. Speaker. And the last time I sat Mr. in this Speaker, house... On a point of order, the St. Lucia Constitution is very clear that the five years is from the point of the parliament. And despite, again, Mr. Speaker, many times that we've stood up in this house to correct members on the opposite side, they continue to persist that there is a requirement. There is no requirement. It's the Constitution, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, we don't have a fixed date for elections in St. Lucia, so there's no requirement for any particular date. If you ask any child in social studies, how often are elections held in the country, they'll tell you every five years. That's what they will tell you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, again on a point of order, I think that it would really be very responsible for members in this House not to misguide the public of St. Lucia. And if, in fact, the people in St. Lucia themselves may be misguided as to what the actual date is, here's a great opportunity for the member to correct them. That the Constitution is very clear, Mr. Speaker. It is five years from the first date of power. Yeah, the Constitution does not And say at that. that point, you have up to 90 days in which to call the elections. And yes, Mr. Speaker, it is the prerogative of the Prime Minister to advise the Governor General when he intends to call the elections. No differently, Mr. Speaker, than when members on the opposite side decided to have elections early or they decide to have elections late. That is their prerogative. So, <coughs> so it is a prerogative, Mr. Speaker, Honorable. and the member from Mickey South is right. Honorable it is his prerogative, Mr. Honorable Speaker. Member, just hold on. Because we just need to settle this thing once and for all, so we're done. Sorry? I'm just trying to get the exact.
You still want me to wait, Mr. Speaker? Yes, yes. What is the other Honorable members, honorable members. Yeah. Let's, let's just. I, every member here was given a copy of the Constitution of St. Lucia. And um, let's, let's get this thing, because I'm, I do not want anybody to believe that. Uh, Section 55 of the Constitution. Prorogation and dissolution. One, the Governor General may at any time prorogue or dissolve Parliament. At any time. Two, that means even before five years. Honorable Member. <laughs> Two, subject to the provision of subsection three of this section, Parliament, unless sooner dissolved, shall continue for five years from the date of the first sitting of the House after any dissolution and shall then stand dissolve. Okay, so the five years is from the first sitting of the House, not from the date of election. Now, honorable members, let's move on. Turn on your mic, good sir. June 6 will be five years since the last election was held in St. Lucia. June 6. June 6. And the people, the, and the people expect there to be elections before June 6. And if you decide... Mr. Speaker, if the member from Miku South decides that he's not ready for elections yet, that he will be defeated in the next general elections and he wants to go up to the five years constitutional life of parliament that's his prerogative but he will still lose the elections mr speaker and if he wants to go a further three months it is his prerogative and he will still lose when the elections are called mr speaker honorable so member? mr speaker i'm not debating with him honorable member now i will say to you honorable members i will now say to you your statement because right. I will not allow you to debate the election. Because, Mr. Speaker, every time I stand here and my colleagues stand here and we speak about five years, a caca blue tick in the member from Miku South. Mr. Speaker, I, I want you to explain to me, Mr. Speaker, you've just referred to the Constitution. You've just referred to the Constitution. The House will dissolve by itself, and the other lawyers in this chamber by whatever date in July, the 15th or whatever, because the five years would be up. What happens thereafter? What happens thereafter? You know, who lifts the state of emergency? It's Parliament. The same member that Mikusov has said to us, he will not have an election under a state of emergency. He said so. So if by July 15th the House dissolves and there's no more Parliament, and I hear the member on Viewford South says there may be an interpretation in the Constitution that the Governor General can recall Parliament if we need to. Why are you doing this? Why, are, why is there the need for such machinations that the House will... On a point of order. Again, Mr. Speaker, it's very sad that I have to stand up as often, but it's important that we do. The member is giving the suggestion that if, in fact, we have a state of emergency, and the House dissolves after July 12th, that there is then no mechanism for the state of the emergency to be withdrawn, which is incorrect. It's simply a proclamation by the Governor General, and that's the point that we've been really? saying all of this evening. A proclamation of the Governor General. That is it. This is what we've been saying, is you put the state of emergency on because you need Parliament to approve the extension, but it only requires a proclamation of the Governor General in order for the state of the emergency to be withdrawn. Okay. And, if, and if that is the advice uh -huh. of, the, of the CMO, Mr. Speaker, C and CMO? the command center, then we will do it. But as I said to you, the requirement right now by those, those technicians is that we still require a curfew. So, Mr. Speaker, Honorable the state of emergency... Honorable Member, tie your submission on the date or election to the extension of the because, state Because, Mr. Speaker, I'm explaining to you why an extension is unwarranted and unnecessary. 
because we have an elephant in the room, which is the general elections. We must refer to it. It is the singular most important event in our civil lives in this country for this year. The election of the government and you extending the state of emergency beyond the date by which it must take place. I must stand, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, Speaker and Mr. Speaker, on a point of order. In order to elucidate my good member from Castri South, if you can probably quote you, you. Mr. Speaker of the Constitution. Yes, Mr. Speaker. No, the reason why I was calling on to you, you said you, you stopped on a point of order, but you were asking to elucidate. No, I was so asking just, you, Mr. Uh -huh. Speaker, to elucidate him uh -huh. the same way that you just did on the matter of the date of the, of the elections. If we can refer to him to Section 17.4 of the Constitution, I think it's very clearly written that if, in fact, we have a state of emergency, that all we have to do is a proclamation by the Governor General to suspend it. So this does not interfere with the election. Trevor, Mr. You see, but that's exactly the point. Honorable member, honorable member, I need to move away from this election. This is not a debate. Mr. Speaker. On, no, no, I'm not stopping you. You, you want to? This is not a debate on the elections, when it should be called or when it is going to be called. Mr. Speaker, it is grossly. Ty, Ty, Ty. I am tying it. I am saying it, it should not be on. extended beyond the date by which we should have elections. I am opposing it because I am saying the date by which it is extended to is involving the date of elections. And I mean, the member from Miku South cannot stand up on points of order, and I am the one who is not supposed to speak about the point. Mr. Speaker, the point has been made. The people of St. Lucia will speak. They want their elections. They expect their elections in five years. And if you don't do it, they know, you know what they will think of a government that is denying them from hosting elections. They know, we know what they will think of the government, Mr. Speaker, of any government that is denying them the chance to vote. But Mr. Speaker, you know, this state of emergency is about two St. Lucia's, two. So the member from Miku South can play golf, Mr. Speaker, but the young boys, it's illegal for them to get a sweat on the playing field. And you have to go, Mr. Speaker, and look at the protocols. You cannot have a social event with more than 10 people. And I want to read it, Mr. Speaker. A person shall not host or attend a social event except with no more than 10 persons of his or her immediate family. So you cannot have a social event with more than 10 persons of your own immediate family. But you can take part in a non-contact spot if there are no more than 15 persons in attendance, excluding spectators and crowds. So you cannot have a gathering of your own family of more than 10, but you can play golf. You can play golf as long as you do not have more than 15 golfers. Can you imagine that? It is there, Mr. Speaker. I'm not making it up. This was stable in this house. There are two solutions, one for one set, but the young boys that are sweating on the playing field, the COVID wardens, run behind them. Run behind them. But you can play golf, Mr. Speaker. Here's another one. A young candidate returns to his, the constituency he's contesting. And it is deemed that there is a mass event. And someone is arrested. Arrested. Lapwet. Monrepo. But in Lapwa Denry next door, there's a mass crowd event. And I have a video clip, Mr. Speaker. Ain't no social media thing. Video clip. With the member for Miku South in attendance and the member for Denry South in attendance. I, Mr. Speaker, I know that in Lapwa Monrepo, there was SSU. There were COVID wardens there. Were they in Lapwa Denry South? There was no COVID warnings in Denry South. There was no SSU in Denry South. And you know what they said? Oh, it was a funeral. A funeral they had about 200 persons or more. And when the commissioner of police was engaged by, by someone about it, he tried to give some kinds of excuses. So SSU is sent to La Puerte Monrepo. COVID warnings are sent to La Puerte Monrepo, but not to La Puerte Denry. Two solutions, Mr. Speaker.
two St. Lucia's, Mr. Speaker. And then, Mr. Speaker, I've already mentioned the PM dancing after nine live on TV, Jerusalem, whatnot, Mr. Speaker. But our Prime Minister can travel to Barbados and return with no quarantine. None, Mr. Speaker. And the CMO has no authority under any of the protocols of the COVID Act, Mr. Speaker, to waive any, man, any put, um, man, quarantine for anyone. She has no legal right to do so. That's a requirement. She cannot waive it. And the Prime Minister and member from Microsoft must explain to this House under what conditions he returned to this country and did not go into quarantine. Honourable that has to be explained, Mr. Speaker, member, because there are two St. Lucia's. Honorable Member, yes, let sir. me remind you to tie your presentation to the... Mr. Speaker, state I'm telling you, that's under the SOE, there are two St. Lucia's. There is one St. Lucia for the ordinary person and a different St. Lucia for certain privileged people, Mr. Speaker. And a member, a former General Secretary of the United Coast Party, and he, he wrote something and I laughed, Mr. Speaker. He said the PM went to Barbados in full PPE. <laughs> Mr. Speaker, that's how comical they make it, that the Prime Minister went to Barbados dressed in full PPE. Mr. Speaker, I'll, 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 if you give me your phone number, I'll WhatsApp it to you, Mr. Speaker. <laughs> <laughs> Mr. Speaker, but that's how comical it is that when somebody goes and comments, how could the Prime Minister go and Barbados and come back? He says he went to Barbados with full PPE. But Mr. Speaker, the long and short of it is this state of emergency is about controlling the people of St. Lucia. It's about trying to suppress the expression of our views and our feelings about the performance of this government for the last five years. This is what it is about. It's about curtailing the campaigning of the St. Lucia Labour Party, Mr. Speaker. It's about preventing the momentum of the people of St. Lucia to get rid of this government, expressing itself out there in the communities, Mr. Speaker. That's what it is about. It's about trying to suppress, Mr. Speaker, Mr. Speaker our discontent about how they've governed this country for the last five years. But that cannot stop the train, Mr. Speaker. That cannot stop the people of St. Lucia. So, Mr. Speaker, this state of emergency is a last desperate effort. It's like a Hail Mary. You just go for the last try. Last try and hope it succeeds, Mr. Speaker. It won't succeed. The people of St. Lucia are fed up of this government. And the longer the Prime Minister takes, is the worse he's making it for all the members of his cabinet and his government, Mr. Speaker. So, Mr. Speaker, but for us in the Labour Party, we are not going to be happy about this because the people want relief. The people want economic support. The people want to be emotionally relieved of the emotional distress, Mr. Speaker. So we're not happy, Mr. Speaker. I end, Mr. Speaker, by reiterating my opposition to the extension of the state of emergency. Thank you very much.